Uh, we're going to continue in our series, Heart, Soul, Mind. Today we're talking about mind and strength. This is our series for the month of November, so get your Bibles out and let's uh, follow along. We're talking out of Mark chapter 12, where Jesus is asked, which is of all the commandments is the most important? And of course, our mind is going to go to the Decalogue. It's going to go immediately go to the Ten Commandments. Um, but that's not what Jesus quotes. Or even the 613 commandments that the, uh, the uh, teachers of the law had instituted through the mitzvot or the Torah. Um, and so I think it's, it's so powerful and it bears repeating every week when we gather, when Jesus is asked, what is the most important commandment of everything? The first word out of his mouth is what? Love. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And then he goes on in verse 31, and the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. And so we boiled those down to what? Love God and love people. And in the 10 commandments, if you look at that, that's what the 10 commandments are. First part is all about loving God of the 10 commandments, and the second half of the 10 commandments is all about what? Loving people. And so uh, this series that we're in is about fulfilling that greatest commandment, to love. Not eros love, not phileo love, but what? Agape love, to love theos, to love Jehovah God, the self-existent one. And so our verse for the entire series is that, Jesus saying, love the Lord your God with all of your, say it with me, heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and all of your strength. And he says all, all mean all together, every wit, throughout, holy, and absolute totality, all, everything. Love him with your dianoia, with your dianoia, with all of your mind. We're going to talk about this word this morning a little bit. Your mind, your understanding, and your imagination. It's a Greek noun, dianoia. And what I find is so interesting, and you got to remember, Jesus, first century, he's talking to these highly educated people, and he uses a word that's over 400 years old. He uses actually a Greek word, which all of these highly educated people will know because the Greeks had a pretty famous philosopher by the name of Plato. Not Plato, Plato. Plato lived 400 years before Jesus. And this is a word that Plato used in his writings. So he's standing in front of these teachers and rather than just kind of mumbling and bumbling through it, he lays this word on them that they're all gonna absolutely positively know because the Greek philosophers, you know, very highfalutin, very intelligent people would be using this type of word. And he lays this word on them. He says, dianoia, the mental faculty used in discursive reasoning, a type of thinking specifically about mathematical and technical subjects. It is the capacity for the process of and the result, result of discursive thinking, whether it is your memory, reflections, your plans, your fantasies, your hopes, your dreams, your judgments, your ideas, your reminiscings, visions, or even your imagination. It is the use of critical thinking to thoroughly work from side to side in one's mind and reach a definition. So when he says dia, noe, he says dia like in, uh, think of any word that has the, that prefix, dia or dia, diode, di, uh, 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 it means two, die as in two, right? So Noah, no, no, Noah, or from your gnosis, to work this, whatever this thought that you have in your mind, you're to work it both sides, dia, noia. From work it, whatever that idea is, you work it from, you massage it. You work it back and forth. You have the Rubik's cube of that idea and you just keep moving it around. You keep spinning it around in your gnosis, in your noia. So that idea is fully formed, balanced in conclusion, and considers both sides of the matter. The anoia. Your mind, your imagination, your understanding, your ability to think critically. Now, obviously, that's a gift from the Lord. We do know that every gift, every good gift is given from the Father. 
that everything started out really good in the world. And there are archetypes of people, and you've all taken your personality test. I preached this maybe six months or a year ago, talking about the personality types, but those are really subject to what Jesus instituted, which is the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, pastor, and teacher. So those are gifts from heaven that can either be used for good or for evil. Just that you have those giftings to pastor people, to shepherd people. It can be used in the church or it can be used in the world. You have apostolic gifts to advance territory, to take new mountains in the church or in the world. And so this idea that everything is redeemable is also insinuated here where Jesus says, use your mind. Because the mind can be a really, really dirty playground, nasty, horrible place. But Jesus says, no, I need you to use your mind for good. Use your mind, the ability to think clearly. So we need to understand that Jesus is not telling us as followers to turn off our minds, but rather to fully engage our minds with critical thought to de to take that idea, move it back and forth, side to side, totally understand it, and have an understanding of what it is that we're believing or talking about. What I think is cool is this interaction that he's having with these teachers, these well-learned, highly educated people, that Jesus, in all of his, in all the red letters of the New Testament, this is the only place he uses this word when he's talking to these to these highly educated people. But the other New Testament writers obviously heard Jesus use the word, we're to love God with our mind, with our dianoia, and that then is echoed throughout the epistles. But Jesus is the one who used it first, and he used it in reference all the way back to the teachings of Plato. In 1 Peter, Peter writes, therefore, in 1 Peter 1.13, prepare your dianoia for action. Prepare your mind for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given to you when Jesus is revealed. Later, 2 Peter 3, 1, dear friends, this is how my second letter to you, I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking, wholesome dianoia. The writers of Hebrews says, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their minds, on their dianoia. Same word that Jesus used. I don't know where you were before you gave your life to Christ, or maybe you're here this morning, you haven't given your life to Christ, and you think, ah, Christians are just a bunch of mindless, mindless lemmings who will believe anything. They'll just, um, you're kidding me, They're just, they've turned off their mind. It's like they've had some sort of frontal lobe lobotomy and they're just not thinkers at all. But that's, that is not true. And if you fall into that, then you're part of the problem. Jesus is saying, engage your mind. Yeah. Use your dianos. Take this idea, and, and whatever comes to you, just don't believe it. Research it. He says, test me. Try me. Check it out. Let me tell you what. Anybody that's got questions, I'm not afraid of. That's why when you go to witness to somebody or share, don't be afraid to say, I don't know. Whatever you do, whatever you do don't blow smoke and try to make up some idea because they're gonna see right through it. That's just, this, is my, this is my commitment to you as a teacher. And by the way, officially we're having an educational hour just for your information. Use your mind, please. Well, I read it on the internet. And so shut up, shut your face. Just because you read it on the internet. There's, there's a doctor, I won't use his name. Some of you may know who he is. He has a coffee cup that says, please don't, please don't misunderstand, please don't confuse your Google search with my MD which I think is just a, an amazing coffee cup. But sometimes, well, so-and-so said, or prophet so-and-so, or who, who are these people? 
coming into your life. One of the things you need to realize about being a Christian is not everything on Christian radio and not every Christian book is a good book or good or should be on the radio. You need to set up a, 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 a like I, I see a screen door that, that certain things do, don't get through because you've set up parameters. Like, wait a second. I know so I, my dianoia, my mind, I've worked my mind, I understand. Show yourself approved. A workman that needeth not be ashamed, who can rightly divide the word of truth. Study. Use your mind. Christianity is a thinking person's faith. In fact, you have an order. You have a commandment from God to love him with all of your mind. Your mind. All of your, all of your, okay, Love the Lord with all your whatever, fill in the blank. With all your heart, yes. With all your soul, yes. With all your strength, everything that you do. With all, every, how about your mind? When was the last time you said, Lord, I wanna worship you? I'm gonna worship, I'm gonna love you with my mind. Wow. So when asked by the expert of the Jewish law, which commandment ranks above everything else? Jesus quoted what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. You know what that is? If you know anything from early Judaism, or even modern day Judaism, you'll know a phrase called the Shema. The Shema, the word Shema, S-H-M-A, Shema, S-H-A-M-A. The Shema, the word Shema means listen or hear, pay attention. In fact, my Hebrew teacher in school, I took Hebrew as my language. Um, whenever he wanted, it, it's because it's got a flashback right now with that word. He would, one hour, he would say, shma, shma, because he spoke, he, he taught the class in Hebrew. You had to know Hebrew well enough that he could teach the class in Hebrew. Right, 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 right. So, shma, 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 listen, listen, pay attention. So the Shema is found in Deuteronomy chapter six. And the beginning of that is Shema Israel. Listen up, Israel. The Lord your God, the Lord is one. Shema Israel. Ha Adonai Eloheinu. Ha Adonai Echad. That's how you say it in Hebrew. Listen up, folks. The Lord your God is one. That's Deuteronomy chapter four, chapter six, verse four. Watch this. Here it goes. Shema Israel ha Adonai Eloheinu ha Adonai Echad. Hero Israel, the Lord your God is one. That's how the Shema starts. But that's not the whole Shema because the very next verse, hit it, Rose, is this. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. This commandments that I give you today are to be written upon your hearts. Impress them upon your children. Talk to them when you sit at home and when you walk on the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols to your hands. That's your doing. And bind them to your foreheads. That's your dianoia, that's your thinking. Bind these words to your hands and to your foreheads. Tell, uh, tell feeling. T e l l i f i n e tefelin. We call them in English. We call them phylacteries. Have you ever heard that term, phylacteries? That's not the Hebrew word. Uh, the Hebrew word is telfilin, telephin, t e l l i f i n. And those are those black boxes that you see uh, wrapped around a Jewish person's arm and bound to their forehead when they pray. Have you ever seen these? Yes. So they take, they take this little leather box, and it's, there's so many rules and regulations. We'll get back to the sermons because it's kind of fun to talk about. Because you bind these to your arm, you tie them to your weak arm, and you wrap, it's a box, and inside that box is what, do you think? A, the scripture, this scripture right here. Deuteronomy 6 is, in, is written in a certain way, on animal skin, in a certain way, in a kosher way, and that box is not a box of wood, it's actually a leather box and certain ties and knots and everything, and it's bound right here on your bicep between your elbow and your shoulder, and that box, that when you rest your arm like this, it's supposed to be touching your heart. 
Uh, uh. And you wrap it, you wrap it, um, you wrap it seven times. The first three form the, the Hebrew letter, this is really cool. For Hebrew letter shin, which is the first letter of the word Adonai, it's just awesome, all the symbolism, seven times all the way down around your middle finger. Then you, then you take the other one, and the other box, you put it right, you put, <laughs> the way the Jews are, man, they're so crazy about this kind of stuff. You, know, you put it not on your forehead, not on the top of your head, but you put it just above your hairline. These are the laws. These are the, this is the law, right above your hairline. And it says, if you happen to be bald, be bald, put it where your hairline, above where your hairline would have been. That's how detailed they get in all this stuff, right? And you put the, and this has actually, this box of leather actually has uh, four compartments in it. And one of the compartments, the first compartment holds this, Shema. Shema Israel. Listen up, Israel. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. But wait a second. Jesus is quoting the Shema? from the Torah, which they all know. And what did I just read to you? Go back to uh, Deuteronomy chapter six, verse four, please. Rose, verse four, his or Israel, the Lord your God, uh, the Lord is one, ha, ha Adonai Echad. Verse five, here it is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Is it up there? Yeah, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Wait a second. Between here and here, what did Jesus do? He added doyania, dianoia. He added that word. He added the word mind because he's talking to these highly educated people. Not just your heart, not just your soul, not your strength, but I want you to know this. I mean, think of what he did. He added a word to the Shema. And he said, listen, guys, here we are. Pay attention. You're gonna need to worship me with your mind. This is a thinking person's religion. Anybody that thinks that you're mindless because you're a Christian has never really understood what Christianity is all about. We're to love the Lord with all of our mind. And so, one of the teachers of the law, verse 28 of Mark 12, one of the teachers of the law came to her to be beating, noticed that Jesus had given them a good answer and said, of all the commandments, which is the most important? And he replies, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. That's verse 29. See, before our text that we've been studying now for the last couple weeks, this is, this, is, this is the conversation that's happening with this teacher of the law right before he says it, verse 29. He says, the most important one, Jesus answered, is, of course, they all know, Shema Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord with all your heart, yeah, 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 with all your soul, yeah, yeah, yeah. But now, dianoia, he adds this word to the Shema. That's important. Jesus was saying, you gotta engage your mind. You gotta have critical thought. You gotta verify words, you gotta test claims. Or as your mom used to say, use the brain that God gave you. Huh, huh, anybody? I mean, I don't wanna be standing in heaven on that day and have the Lord come up to me and say, couldn't you just use the brain that God gave you? Some of the stuff you were thinking, some of the stuff you were believing, just because it was on Sid Roth's show or just because Rabbi so-and-so wrote it or because it was in that book. Oh, 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 you haven't get those things forwarded to you on email, on Facebook, any of that? Listen, the first thing I wanna do, in fact, somebody, somebody who I know, someone who I respect and somebody who I trust forwarded something to me in this genre in the last 72 hours. And I said, even though it was a tweet from a reliable source, I said, did you verify? Did you go back to that source? Did you go back to Judicial Watch? And did you see that that was actually on their page? He said, no, I have not. I said, I can't, I, I, that, that information is useless to me. I need a primary source. I don't need Sister Susie sent it to Sister Larry who sent it to, uh, oh, that, it must, it, listen, this was a reliable source I got it from. Yet he had not verified it. So I went to Judicial Watch's Twitter page to see if I could find the date and the tweet, and guess what? It wasn't there. Somebody had made up the Judicial Watch header and put this information underneath it. You know why? I use my Dianoia. Imagine that. I just don't mindlessly regurgitate something someone fed me. 
I'm not here to tell you what to think. How many times do I have to say this? I'm here to help you learn how to think. Because the decisions that you make when you stand before God, you're not gonna be able to say, well, Pastor Hansen said. I will be responsible for what I said. There's no doubt about that. But you've got to understand for yourself why you believe what you believe. And have a conviction for crying out loud. 1 Thessalonians 5.21, test everything. I'm not saying don't believe. I'm not saying don't have faith. I'm not saying trust God for big stuff. But test everything and then hold on to what is good. Set up that theological mesh in your heart, in your spirit, and once it gets in, hang on to it. Fight for it. Revelation 2.2, 2, Jesus commended the church at Ephesus because they have tested those who call themselves apostles and uh, are not and found to be false which is an argument for apostles. If you can have false apostles, you can truly have apostles. So that's an argument for apostleship. But he said not everybody that has a television show, not everybody that writes a book, not everybody who has it, your ear is telling you maybe they didn't even use their dianoia. They just repeated what somebody else repeated. Some of the things that you believe are in the Bible aren't in the Bible. Cleanliness is next to godliness, not in there. Not in there. Second Timothy 2, 15. We are told to do your best to present yourself to be approved as a workman that does not need to be ashamed and who rightly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. The Christian, let me tell you something about Christianity that you don't maybe not know. We have played, and I say we collectively as Christians, we collectively have played the most pivotal role in the development of higher education in the world today. That's on us. Because early on, Christians actually dedicated themselves to learning, not just coming and raising their hands and singing a song. That's all wonderful. I think that's great. I'm not diminishing one to elevate the other. They are both and, not either or. But if you don't love him with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all of your mind, you're missing out on the greatest, the greatest commandment from God Almighty is to love him with your mind. Christian schools, let me name a few Christian schools to you. Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Oxford, Cambridge, St. Andrews, the oldest university in Scotland, University of Edinburgh, and on and on and on and on and on. Those were all founded as Christian universities. Every one of them, Harvard, Yale, all the Ivy schools. But then what happens is you pervert the anoia to the top, not God, because man thinks in his mind, oh, I got it, I don't need God anymore, <laughs> right? Everything must be subject to him, even your mind. Now, an author, you may not know his name, but he's actually a local author. His name is Alvin Schmidt, doctor. Um, he wrote a book called How Christianity Transformed Civilization. He writes this, formally educating both, sex, both sexes was largely a Christian innovation. Christianity's aim early on was universal education, not education defined or confined just to the rich as among the Greeks or the Romans, and it made no distinction between the sexes. This matter produced great results. For the first 500 years of Christianity, the first five centuries, St. Augustine said that a Christian woman, said that Christian women were often better informed on divine matters than pagan male philosophers. He goes on, as a side note in, the, in, this, in his book, he says he's a graduate of Southern Illinois University, Carbondale, uh, which also had its roots in Christianity back in 1869. The school motto, I don't know if you know this, of Southern, of SIU, uh, is uh, Deo Volente, God willing. 
the, the, the mottos of these schools in Latin are often giving praise to God. Yale, Harvard, Oxford. That's us. We did that. Christians founded those. Pastors founded those. Christians have always had and always been hardy proponents of using our minds, our dianoia. Jesus said, the most important thing you can do is to worship God with your mind. We're all called to worship the Lord with our mind, all of our cognitive abilities. So I thought, first sermon of the New Testament, Peter on the day of Pentecost. What does he do? He stands up on the day of Pentecost. He, doesn't, he does not drill down to their emotions. He does not drill down to economy or go to uh, society. You know what he does? He goes right for their mind. As you know, as you have read, as you have studied, until the end, he offers the phrase, as you yourselves know, he's playing to their dianoia, the facts. True Christians have always valued intellectual ex excellence. We've been commanded to study, to examine the claims that are brought before us, not to accept just any attempt by any person to pass along what they say as Christian truth as being truth. Guilty, I almost fell. It wasn't a Christian truth, it was just a, it was just a political statement this past, almost fell for it. I have fallen for it. And how much worse would it be that you actually knew that it wasn't true, but it would further your cause and you pass it along anyway? That's blasphemy. That's what that is. But we are called to rightly divide the word. Yes, believe. Yes, have faith. Yes, believe. Yes, pray. Yes, trust the Lord. But we need to do everything that the Bible instructs us to do, and that is also to use our minds. We're commanded to worship the Lord with all of our minds. So I have a few things for you to write down, if you'd like to, how you can practically do that. Number one is take sermon notes. <clears throat> what I tell you, let me just say this. I asked a pastor once, I asked a, a, an instructor once, I remember his name, he went on to be a Bible college uh, a seminary uh, president, man, he just recently communicated with me. His name is Dr. Howard Young. Dr. Howard Young, affectionately, as students would call him Uncle Howie behind his back. He didn't know that. <laughs> and I was knocking on his door one day in his office, and he didn't answer the, didn't answer the door. I go, uh, and I was exasperated because it had to do with a test or something. And I kind of leaned against the door and went, Uncle Howie. And the door opened, and he was standing there. <laughs> Dr. Young, excuse me. <laughs> so how long does it take you to write a sermon? He goes, well, see, I've been in the ministry for 25 years, so I, take, I guess it takes me 25 years to write a sermon. <laughs> wow. Because you're, you're an eager Bible college student. You know, you got five days in the work week or whatever. You can sit down on Monday or Tuesday. Well, you sit down. You got, how long does it take you to write that sermon? He says, it takes me 25 years to write that sermon because I'm taking all the information that I've got, everything that I've learned along the way. That's the power of reading a book, by the way. A book that you can read in three or four evenings, you're able to suck information out of someone that may have taken 50 years to learn what you just read in three nights. That's the power of study, of learning. That's so cool. So how long does it take you to write a sermon? 25 years, it's like, oh, wow. Like, what I'm sharing with you today, I didn't write in 10 minutes. Almost two full days, 16 hours, if you want to know, plus the other 30 years of ministry that I have. So I'm not just like winging, I'm just not some little something, you know, some little fancy little Facebook page you can click on. And No, this is, listen, I want you to understand that the things that I'm telling you are vitally important. I'm going to be held accountable to the things that come out of my mouth, that they are true and that they are right. But you should check me. You know Why? because some of the things I preached 25 years ago, I don't believe today. <laughs> Woo, not a pastor in this town said that this morning. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you, I'm growing, I'm learning, I'm maturing. I believe things today that perhaps I didn't believe 25, 30 years ago. That's a good thing. 
Because let me tell you what, all the revelation you have when you get to heaven, you stand before God, he's gonna go wrong, 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 wrong about that theology. So you best be humble in what you do know. We don't learn in order to the Bible says, to lord it over other people. That's why you end up with Yale being the institution that it is today, Harvard being the institution that it is today. Not subject to the word of God. I digress. So take sermon notes. I think what I'm giving you is decent food. Number two, how can you love God with all of your mind? Attend a connect group and discuss this. You go to a connect group, now you got five, six, seven people sitting around saying, hey, what did pastor say on Sunday? Well, this is what it meant to me, this is what I heard. What about that? Well, I checked it out, this is what I read, da 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 and you sit there, uh, 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 uh. But if you just take what I gave you, which is basically a happy meal, giving you a happy meal, maybe a little, maybe a step above a happy meal, because you have to understand, I'm, I'm preaching to somebody that's walked with the Lord for 40 years over here, and somebody just started serving God for the last 10 days over here. I mean, I'm like, I'm like a doctor trying to, to, to take care of, you know, hundreds of people with one shot. So in the spirit realm, I stand up here, not with a, a laser-guided missile. Perhaps the Holy Spirit allows that to penetrate your heart. But in the spirit, I stand up here with a shotgun, double-barreled, sawed off, as wide as spread as I can get, and I'm going, <laughs> why? Because I want what I have to be broad enough to be applicable to everyone. Now, if I'm just speaking to a room full of PhDs, my sermon's gonna be a little different. If I'm teaching a bunch of fourth and fifth graders, my teaching's gonna be a little different. Fourth and fifth grade. You know what I'm doing? I'm rewriting the catechism for fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, and I'm personally gonna sit down with all the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders in this church, and I'm gonna have a class for them on the catechism for little kids. So that, number one, they get to hang out with me for a while, which is not super cool, kind of awkward maybe for them, but for me it's super cool. You know, and to sit around, to sit around three or four eight-foot tables with a bunch of fifth graders, talking to them about who God is and what God is. I mean, I'm looking forward to that. I'm about halfway through, about halfway through writing that, so hopefully by the first of next year, we'll be able to offer that class to the young kids of our, of our congregation. Why? Because this stuff is important. There's a handful of people in this room maybe don't know what the 10 commandments are and you've walked with God for 10 years. Or something kind of important like the Apostles' Creed, maybe. Well, you know, we're Pentecostal charismaniacs. We don't need to know all that stuff. Well, I think you do. I think you do need to use your dianoia a wee bit. Let's talk about the Lord's Prayer. What does that mean? Well, I don't know. We give us this day our daily bread and forgive us. Yeah, okay, great. Maybe you have it memorized, maybe you don't. What do those phrases mean? And how then does that apply to you? And if having that information, how should that change what you think or what you do? Isn't that a wonderful challenge for a fifth grader? How about somebody that's 50? Yeah, for all of us. Why? Because we're supposed to love God with all of our dianoia, with all of our mind. Not just with jumping up and down and raise your hand and sing a song and give a check. That's all wonderful. This is not either or, it's both and. When was the last time you engaged your mind beyond some mindless sixth grade level drivel that somebody wrote for the masses that tickled you because it was a blood moon? can't say amen, you might be able to say ouch. I don't know. <laughs> Are you stepping on toes? Well, they're sticking out, that's why. <laughs> Number one, take sermon notes. Number two, attend a connect group and discuss the Sunday morning sermon. Number three, go to growth track. If you've been on the counter, go to growth track every Wednesday night, right over there at that whiteboard, right there. Live, connect, grow, and go. The vision of the church. Learning, digging in, digging in. Not deep, we're just kind of scratching the surface, but for some, it's a lot. For others, eh, but we all have to start somewhere. Get to growth track. If you haven't been, get it. That's all stuff we can do for you. How about your own, your own personal growth, your own personal Bible study? Is there a Bible somewhere in your house that's open right now? Don't answer. It's just open and there's a notepad there. And you're not, you're not doing anything other than just reading the word. Get it. Listen, I I'm a, used to be, a, and still am, somewhat, of an advocate. You know, read through the Bible in a year. Well, 
If you read through it in a year and you don't apply anything and you're just doing it because you're gonna read the Bible in a year, it's nothing to you. How about you read until you get an aha, till you get a eureka, till you have an epiphany, to go, whoa, what was that? All of a sudden that pricked my heart. Stop, don't go any farther. I just read three verses. So my whole devotional time is gonna be on that verse. I wonder what that means. I wonder what he was trying to say to me. Well, who said it? When did he say it? Where did he say it? Who was he speaking to? Like this, speaking to the, it means more to us because we know who Jesus was talking to. But if you don't get context for what it is you're studying and what you're believing, listen, you're not using your whole dianoia with all of your mind. Get a concordance. What is a concordance? I don't know. You'll have to find out. It'll help you. Personal growth. Somewhere in your life, there needs to be a Bible that's open or an iPad, or I'm not against technology. But one of the things that this has done to us is you don't bring your Bibles anymore, right? So you bring, you bring, you bring a thing, and I'm, I'm down with the thing. I love the thing. But when I'm studying the Bible, when I'm studying the Bible, I'm not studying it here. I got, this, I got, my, got two, I guess I used to have all the books. I don't have all the books anymore, all that, because I get that stuff online. I pull up the concordance, and I pull up the dictionary, and I pull up the Greek, and I pull up the Hebrew, and I have all that. It just saves a lot of time. But did something about touching that paper and underlining that thing and writing a note in the side means something to me. Because you can ask me a verse, and you know what begins to happen? I begin to see it. I see it. Oh, it's on that page. It's on the bottom left-hand side. It's highlighted in yellow. I know exactly where that's at. And what it does begins to build stuff in your spirit. So those are things that you can do, you can do beyond what the church is doing. That's your personal growth, your Bible study. And then fifthly, I've already hit this, I've already hammered this, and that is just don't rely on what other people say. Find out for yourself. And everything I've told you today, go double check it. Because I need to know if I'm wrong, because I don't want to stand there and say something, say something wrong. I want to say what's right. And there's been some stuff that I've, man, that's, that preaches. Somebody, what the, somebody said the other day, did you hear that so, this in the Bible was true? And I said, I think I was riding with, I think I was riding with, with, uh, with Ryan. We were in a conversation about something. And you asked me, did you know, did you, have you ever heard? And I said, you know, I don't know. I couldn't answer him. I said, I don't know if that's true or not. I'm honest enough to say I don't know that that's truly in the Bible, and I would have to check that out myself. So this is the gauntlet for us today. It was love God with all of our, what? Our cardia, all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and now with all, next week is all of our strength. So hopefully this is something that becomes bedrock truth for you, because this is the most important thing. Should he have walked in the room this morning, turned and addressed all of us, he would say, tell us, Lord, what's the most important thing we need to know? And the first word out of his mouth was love. Love the Lord. Love God Almighty with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. Engage your mind. Engage your mind. Stop walking through life as a mindless Christian lemming who will eat anything that smells good or looks good. Amen. You, listen, there's some stuff. You know what I gave you today? I gave you Brussels sprouts. There are pastors that love to pass out ho-hos and ding-dongs and zingers. I like that. I like doing that. You know why? Because everybody's standing up, oh, you go, pastor. Oh, you go, pastor. That's so good, pastor. That's what you get when you start preaching ho-ho, ding-dongs, and zingers. You know, notice I didn't get shouted down today preaching asparagus and Brussels sprouts. That's okay. You know why? Because my responsibility is not to tickle your ears, but to drill down past that into your heart and your mind and your soul and your strength and say, you know what? Grow up. Grow up, get a clue, and begin to engage your mind. Anybody that totally, 100% seeks after God will find him. That's why I'm never afraid of a question. And don't ever go to God and be afraid to ask him the big question. He's not afraid of your questions. And if you ever engage, oh, I gotta tell you this and let you go. If you ever engage with a Christian that doesn't allow you to question, get away. Get away. Because just questioning doesn't mean I believe that. I just need to know and have a better understanding. Do you really, do you really believe in the Trinity? You, what do you mean I believe it? Of course I believe it. Don't you ever ask that again, you, you heretic. No, no, I should have a reason why I believe the Trinity is real. And your question doesn't scare me. So let's come now, reason. 
together and come to a conclusion. That's how it should be. So don't be afraid of questions, amen? Use your mind, amen? All right, stand up with me today. Teaching hour is over. <laughs> Teaching hour is over. The protest is now concluded. Thanks for coming. I don't know if anybody be here today. It's a weird time, isn't it? But I want to use my mind. I just want to use my mind. And use it in loving God. See what I mean? So someone at one time or another embarrassed you or you felt weird because you were studying? No, what you were doing is you were worshiping God. You worship God when you study to show yourself approved. So thanks for being here today. Did a memorial service yesterday for Donovan. That was bittersweet. Poppy's dad passed away this week. We're praying for you. They're gonna have a visitation this afternoon and funeral tomorrow. What a great guy. You, I, you probably remember that I asked him to participate in a sermon once. He was a Golden Gloves champ in the state of Illinois two years, for two different years. And I had him bring his boxing gloves and he came to the stage and we talked about fighting the good fight of faith. It's Gianna's birthday today. It's Ariel Dearman's birthday today. Happy birthday to baby G and, and Ariel. So many great things happening. You can, you can get depressed and you can get hurt, but you know, um, we're family. We're, we're family. I appreciate, maybe this is the first time you've been here today. Um, we're pretty real people. Um, we want you to live your life. We want you to be happy. And we give away color TVs every week, so you should come back next week. <laughs> Thanks for doing life with me and Cheryl. We love you guys. Father, we bow our heads today in honor of your son, Jesus. And thank you for the price that he paid, that we might come and laugh, have joy, that we might see each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. The world is really looking for you, God, and may each of us not be the stumbling block as they come after you. May we keep ourselves out of the way so they can see who you really are, how beautiful you are, how loving you are. As you're looking for that love and that acceptance and the beauty of all that is heaven, it's found in only one place, and that's at the foot of the cross, looking fully into his face, the one who died for you, his name is Jesus. So forgive us our trespasses and lead us not into temptation. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. If you're ready to make a first-time commitment or recommit your life to Jesus this morning, now's the time. Just lift your hand with me. Father, I recommit my life to you as I do, I think, probably almost every day. I say yes. Because my life is a living sacrifice and the problem with living sacrifices are that they crawl right back off the altar in the middle of the night. So we place ourselves back on the altar this morning and we give ourselves to you we are so sorry for how we have screwed up, things we've said or done that haven't honored you. We ask for and accept your forgiveness so that we might start anew today. Thank you, God, for a fresh start. If you're accepting and receiving that today, right there, under your breath, just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> what a great phrase. Thank you, Jesus that we might say it hundreds of times a day for it's deserving of every breath that we take. And now may the peace of God that passes understanding guard your heart, keep your mind in Christ Jesus. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and Holy Spirit, amen and amen.